Welcome to Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom, where wisdom comes from everywhere. This is a podcast about generational wisdom shared to help build a bridge for future generations and to build stronger communities through education, technology, and health. Welcome to Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom. Hola, mi gente. Thank you for supporting the Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom podcast. We're heading into the halfway mark of the year, which is June, which celebrates a lot of things for us. One is we will be ending our season four and heading into season five. The second thing is the summer solstice is coming up, and that's really a great time of year for us to really be centered in power and, and really ask for the things that we want moving into the next six months of the year. And it's my birthday, and I'm very excited to celebrate it with all of you through these podcasts and to have all these Latinas and Latinos and Comunidad joining us and supporting us more importantly through this podcast because we're really giving a platform for folks that are not seen in the bigger picture, that are really changing things in community, that are really spearheading a lot of initiatives and partnerships with big companies and academia that we don't get to hear enough of. So my guest today is Jennifer Garcia. Jennifer is the Chief Operating Officer for Latino Business Action Network, LBAN. It is a nonprofit organization that is strengthening the United States by advancing Latino entrepreneurship, and it is partnered with Stanford University through their business graduate school. So what this means is that they provide cohorts to scale Latino businesses because we want to change the mindset of Latinos to say, hey, we can move beyond just a small business. We can be that billion dollar company. We can be that next technology platform like Google, Facebook, Apple. Why is it so hard for us to think in those terms of being that next big entrepreneur? In the show notes, we will have their 2022 research report, State of Latino Entrepreneurship, which was spearheaded and done by the Stanford Graduate School of Business. It is a Latino entrepreneur initiative. Lots of information and data. The one point we'd like you to take away from this podcast with Jennifer today is that the financing for scaling a Latino business is the big challenge here. Even though we have all of our resources, our ducks in a row to get funding, to get that big loan to scale our business, we are still met with barriers. Jennifer will break it down for us today by talking about the Latino and the Latina entrepreneur experience through these cohorts, which she has led over 900 scaled Latino and Latina entrepreneurs across the United States. And it has contributed $5.4 billion in annual revenue. So welcome Jennifer Garcia to Latinas from the block to the boardroom. Welcome, Jennifer. I'm excited to have you as my guest today. And what we'll be talking about is really important. I think I've seen you twice now, which is great, at the LBAN, which is the Latino Business Action Network Summit that's held at Stanford every year. And then also at South by Southwest, where LBAN, and I believe SLAY is what it's called, was doing a few panels and talking about the investment into Latino businesses and the future of entrepreneurs of the Latino community and what that means as far as trying to bridge the wealth gap. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be part of this conversation. And even more importantly, I'm excited for what you're building with Latinas from the block to the boardroom and the message, the narrative, the inspiration that you're able to communicate out to the community. So Again, thank you for the opportunity to be in conversation with you today. 
Oh, yeah, no problem. I mean, I feel like it's our time, you know, post-COVID. The communities had a few setbacks, but where you are in representing this initiative, which I'd like you to, to share a little bit about with the Stanford Graduate School of Business and what they're providing as far as a entrepreneur pathway for Latinos is great because it's not just here in the Bay Area. It's actually nationwide from what I understand. So can you tell me a little bit about your journey, first of all, as a Latina in financial services, I believe you worked at Bloomberg, and I want to understand a little bit of what was that pivotal moment for you to be in finances? Yeah, absolutely. Well, if I could maybe start a little bit a few years before that. Sure. I grew up in northern New Mexico in a very small community, rural community. It's, it's Mora, New Mexico, for <laughs> the very few that have probably heard about it. Uh -huh. Um but I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. So my mother was an educator. My father had his own business. So after school weekends, we as children were working in the business, working with my dad. And, you know, it was nothing glamorous. It was hard work. We would dig trees, gather rock, gather firewood. We'd sell it. And that's how my dad's business got started. And so that was what I grew up in. Mm -hmm. it was a lot of work. It was sales, right? Everything was about sales and how we could continuously drive sales, even though we didn't talk about it in that form. But my mom, being an educator, always instilled education and focus on our studies. And, and my dad, these words still ring in my head. He said, you could either go to school or you could stay here with me and work with the pala. And I was like, absolutely, I'm going to school. So I, I went to school in Colorado. I studied finance, uh, really had an aspiration to, to work in the finance industry, to work at Wall Street, quite frankly. But life would take me the other direction and brought me to the West Coast. I started my career in a money management firm, and then I spent over 13 years with Bloomberg Financial. Mm -hmm. And I had an opportunity to work with incredibly intelligent individuals, everything from sales, account management, product development, product support, focused on some niche financial products, securitized mortgages, commercialized mortgages, mm -hmm. portfolio analytics, et cetera. And through all of that experience, Teresa, I think it's what really you value is all of the soft skills that you build along the way. Mm -hmm. And it's those soft skills that can be transferred anywhere. Right. So my pivotal moment is I had gone on a missions trip to the Philippines and I had this very profound and fundamental experience with impact, right? I was able to have impact on somebody's life and not only have it, but see it. A lot of people don't have that benefit of being able to see the impact that we have. So coming back from that, my world was just different and I couldn't do life as I had done before. Mm -hmm. And I remember dreading to go back to work, not anything to do with the work that I was doing or, you know, my environment at work, but more that internally my heart was longing for something more. Like I knew there was more out there. I just couldn't pin it and I couldn't articulate it at the time. And I was also very cautious is that I didn't want to jump ship just to find myself with another company doing something similar. Where I knew I wanted to be intentional and I wanted to have a calculated decision into my next move. So I resigned from Bloomberg. I started my own consulting. I, I was working with small businesses on focused on growth strategies, focused on people development. And it was extremely rewarding because it brought me back to that moment of like impact, right? This is my work was impactful and the people that I was that I was working with. I later came in connection with Latino Business Action Network, LBAN. And I saw that as an opportunity to scale myself. So what I was doing in consulting on a one-to-one -one level, I was now able to bring to a one-to-many in that working with many entrepreneurs and business owners from across the country. So going back, when I think about how I went from industry to nonprofit, it was internal shaking that caused me to step out of what I called like my golden handcuffs, right? Like mm -hmm. very safe to be in a corporate environment. For me, that was a very safe, lucrative environment. But I knew that there was more. 
So it was an internal shaking. I stepped out. It was scary and adventurous and exciting all at the same time. And I I think it was a stepping stone to where I am today. That's awesome. Yeah, I think a lot of us in that corporate world have that experience that are trying to transition into what can I do more? And I think it's after an experience like that, whether you've traveled somewhere or you've been impacted, like many of us have through the pandemic recently, the shift in what does it really mean to have resources to really make an impact for your community after we see so many things. I mean, this is like another wave of change that's happening. And I think that's amazing. I've had other folks that have been on here and I hear a theme about there's that pivotal moment that really just kind of grabs you and just says, you know, I want to do more. And I think that's awesome. And we are in a time of change. Thank you for sharing that. And I would add that, Today, more than ever, we're in a time of change where there is no norm, right? Like we're able to craft our new normal. Mm -hmm. So what's the change that's happening from workplace change, the future of work, working in person, working remote, hybrid, being able to craft your own roles. Like I'm seeing this more and more now than I ever have before, which is really, really exciting and leaves a lot of opportunity for creativity and for innovation. Right. Absolutely. And that's why I think if you're on the cusp of change and it feels uncomfortable, that's okay because that's something telling you you're bigger than where you are now. And you should really explore that because the fear that you feel is what's trying to keep you in the safe place. But if you just tippy toe or just explore or do some research into what you think is something that could fill in the gap that could be a problem solver for your community or how you can innovate something that you're using on a daily basis. I mean, there's so many things that we can do right now. So Jennifer, can you tell me what L band stands for and what it means to the Stanford Graduate Business School? Yes, I would love to. So LBAN is short for Latino Business Action Network. We are a nonprofit. We're based here in the Silicon Valley. We partner with Stanford University, but our entire focus is to advance Latino entrepreneurship across the country. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? We have three specific areas of focus. One is research. The second is education. And the third is ecosystem development. So I'll briefly describe those three pillars. On the research side, we survey business owners every year because we want to understand what is the operating environment? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities for these business owners? Then we produce a report. We facilitate a research summit, which you were referencing earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. And our focus and really what we aim to do is allowing that data to inform policy on a government level and also within private institutions. So that's the research side. The second area of focus is education. On the education, we facilitate a business scaling program at Stanford Graduate School of Business. We run the program twice a year. We bring in approximately 80 business owners, Latino business owners, And the focus is all about scale. How do we challenge these business owners to redefine what they have traditionally thought of growth and scale and the ways that they traditionally pursued it? So if we could get business owners to think bigger, then we can provide them with the resources and the tools and the business principles to take their company to the next level. The program itself is facilitated by Stanford professors, We augment it with one-on-one mentorship, a lot of content and assignments around capital because that is a critical component and one of the biggest challenges Latino business owners face. Mm -hmm. And then we're industry agnostic and we're national. So we have participants from across the country who participate in the program. That is the second pillar, that's education. So the third area of focus is ecosystem development. And on the ecosystem, we take all of our graduates, and today we have over a 1,000 graduates from that program. We take a network of mentors, our network of capital providers, and capital providers range from the national banks, community banks, CDFIs, angel investors, as well as VCs. Mm -hmm. 
And then the last element there is a network of corporate partners. And we ask ourselves, what do we need to continuously do so that we are fostering the ongoing growth of these companies? And that comes in a variety of shapes and sizes. So we have a huge initiative on access to capital, access to contracts, both in government and corporate contracts, access to resources and education, and then access to networks. So there's a lot that we do, but it is all centered around what we're doing. Is it advancing Latino entrepreneurship? Are we supporting business owners to grow and scale their company? Right. I think that's perfect in the support, right, in that community foundation, because you are absolutely correct in what I'm doing today and working with a lot of small businesses, mostly women, Latinas, women of color that are starting. They're in that scale mode. And I have to tell you, including myself, there is a mindset change around money that has to happen. And a lot of us do have it and some of us don't. And I think that comes from a cultural perspective. I think it comes from multi-generations of trauma as well. And how do you get past that, right? Because there's so much that goes on within ourselves that we know we want to go further and to expand and bring more people into an economic employment opportunity, partner opportunity, as well as community growth opportunity. And so these areas that you just mentioned cover all of those. And I think it's just fantastic. And I guess what brought me around to this with you is the report that came out, which is the 2022 Entrepreneurial Report, which came out with some very interesting statistics. And I know that you were also at South by Southwest with Alban talking a little bit, not specifically to the report, but about investment opportunities. Do you want to share a little bit about the conference? Yes. So we were at South by Southwest this year. It was my second time. And a lot of our focus being part of the conference is really to bring awareness. Primarily our biggest challenge as a nonprofit and a small nonprofit is to bring awareness to what it is that we do, to bring attention to our data and to bring the awareness of the opportunity for other Latino business owners and Latino founders when it comes to our scaling program. Mm -hmm. So I participated in several different workshops, panel discussions, and a lot of it comes again in this form of education, right? Understanding what is the opportunity when you think about the Latino market, when you think about specifically Latino business owners, what is the opportunity for them to grow their company? What is the contribution that Latinos are making to the U.S. GDP in the form of small business growth? in the form of job creations? Mm -hmm. And then what is the opportunity and and the resources that can wrap and provide a support structure for these founders to scale? So that's a lot of our focus is how do we go and bring awareness to what we do? And then how do we recruit new business owners to participate in our scaling program? A great part of the whole conference is networking and meeting individuals from literally across the country and across the world Yep. to say, is there area of cross collaboration where we can support the network and support our community? Mm-hmm. So while we were there, one of the areas that I was able to speak on in, in the conference or the panel discussion where you and I met, mm-hmm. we were talking about capital and investment opportunities And so I really just began to frame like the contributions that Latinos are making as it pertains to small business and small business formations, right? So one of the things that I had the opportunity to share, and again, because I work at Elban, my world is really around Latino entrepreneurship. And so I was able to share, and again, coming back to informing, right? Informing the public about Mm -hmm. Latino entrepreneurship, specifically within the United States. But one of the things that our data tells us is that Latinos are the fastest growing cohort of small businesses. So what does that mean? In the last 10 years, we outpaced the national average of job of business creation. So we are starting new businesses at a faster rate than the national average. So not only are we starting new businesses, but our job creation and our job growth is also outpacing 
white-owned businesses. And I specifically say that because our data is in comparison to white-owned companies. Mm -hmm. And then the third element that we look at on a macro level is revenue growth. And again, Latinos are outpacing white-owned businesses as it pertains to revenue. Mm -hmm. So when we look at these very macro figures, we're saying Latinos are responsible for new business formations. Mm -hmm. They're responsible and outpacing the job creations, and they are growing revenues at a faster rate than the national average. Yep. Fantastic headline. Right. Now you dig into this and we say, okay, (laughs) tell me more. Right. So this is where we begin to explore what truly is the operating environment. What are the contributions and the challenges? And so we begin to look at the challenges specifically at financing and their access to capital. And this Mm -hmm. was a panel discussion. Our data shows that Latinos are significantly underfunded when it comes to national bank loans. What we wanted to do is we wanted to uncover At the time of application, how does their access to bank loans compare to white-owned businesses? Considering we hold all things constant, meaning we hold, we had similar credit scores, similar size of business. Latinos actually had lower debt, Mm -hmm. similar profitabilities. What was the difference in approval rates? And we found that for Latinos, they were underapproved in every size of loan mm-hmm. except for 50000 or less. Now, when you think about the challenge that presents, right, a $50,000 loan is gone. That's nothing. It's right? nothing. Yeah. It's nothing when you want to scale up. I know this. $50,000 for me would probably take me with less than one person on my team that's like a part-time and not even giving me a salary at all like the forget it I mean with the production and everything in the business granted I would have customers but the in and out right of operating costs versus revenue in and then you want to scale up it's a huge thing it's nothing really it's it's barely anything to keep you going and that's just for me on a product services side when you talk about restaurant owners, e-commerce, everything that it takes to run a business, that's nothing. And think about those that have to make an investment in capital, like physical buildings or assets, $50,000, again, is not going to cut it. And oftentimes, these are the type of investments that are needed so that they could acquire these assets that would allow them or position them to get bigger contracts. So there's a significant challenge in that. I am encouraged that there are key players around the table wanting to have the conversation about why is this data showing what it is and what do we need to do to address it? You know, it's a systemic challenge that didn't happen overnight. You know, this is decades in the making. Right. But I believe that when we have the awareness, now we know how to articulate the problem and we can begin to explore and identify solutions to the problem. Right. And, you know, just to go back to that report again, you surveyed over 10,000 small business owners of 5,000, which were uh, Latino owned, and then the other 5,000 were not Latino. Let's just say that. And I'm trying to put the numbers together here, but when we're 20% of the population, when you have that much data that you're comparing, like, why are we not approved? To start a business, you have to have a business account. You have to go to a bank. You have to have your own account and your business account. So if we have a higher number of people starting businesses with that amount of licensing going to a bank, and yet we're not approved for loans or to get funding, my mind is just still trying to wrap around this number of being 20% of the population. We're the fastest growing entrepreneur segment, and we're not getting funded. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me. So I want to know how we're going to close this gap. Like, what are the solutions you think now? Well, if I could just add on the other side of this, right? Because when we talk about this data here, Uh this is specifically for debt financing. So approval rates from the national banks. But if you look at companies who are Uh equity-based, meaning they're getting equity funding from angel investors or venture capitalists, Uh the problem is even bigger and more astounding. 
So to give some numbers behind this, Latinos are actually over-indexing in tech, meaning of all the Latino businesses out there, which is uh, nearly 5 million, uh-huh. 19% of those are tech-owned companies. Wow. Meaning VC-backed companies. For white-owned businesses, there's 14% are tech or VC-backable companies. So we are, in sheer numbers, we're still smaller, but percentage-wise, we are over-indexing in this segment. But when you look at the funding aspect, only 2% of VC capital goes into Latino businesses. That's crazy to me. That just makes absolutely no sense. I'm still trying to put my head around it, but it's just astounding to me. Well, and you know, I think data is the language of business. People want to know the data. So what I see, back to your early question, like, I think the big opportunity is to understand the economic opportunity that's being left on the table when yes. Latinos are underfunded and experience significantly lower approval rates. Uh-huh. Because these are quality businesses, investable businesses that are not getting access. So this is an untapped market where, you know, they're leaving this on the table and surely on the equity side, there's hundreds, if not thousands, where investors are just not seriously considering the opportunity and the return that would come with that. I'm always fascinated by this because I know it's going to take, what's the business model for the ROI? Meaning, you know, what's their return on investment? It's like, you know what? We are the largest consumers in the nation. We make up what? Just the Latinos alone, it's like a $2.1 trillion consumer purchasing power. We share things the most over social media. We buy and sell things amongst our community. Tech, if you're just telling me that number, why would you not want to invest in not only the Latino community, but all other communities that are contributing to the buying power? You can only sustain it and build more upon it if you do that. There's a gap, and I'm trying to see what the gap is for people listening to have an opportunity to say, I want to step into this gap and create the next building block. Yeah, I think, again, it's not a problem that was created last night, right? So if you think about your dinner table conversation, certainly I could reflect on mine. I was not talking about VCs. My parents held their savings under the corchon and the mattress. Like, We weren't talking about banks. There was no relationship with the banker. Like those are not the conversations that we commonly have around the dinner table. Mm -hmm. And so what does that translate into? We don't have the connections, right? So we don't have, I still don't have the Theo that's a banker executive at a bank or the cousin that now works at a VC. Like we don't have that. And so our access to that type of information, and more importantly, the access to those networks are not there. We, mm-hmm. we don't have that. So we are building, we're, we're pushing through these, you know, this structure that we've acquired that we, you know, that has been placed upon us as we've grown up in this country. Like we've, we're pushing against this structure. We're recreating or establishing for the very first time. And it takes time. It takes interconnected networks. It takes collaboration. Uh But from the institutional side, it takes reevaluation. And I could give you a specific example of what I mean by that. As we were preparing for our research summit, we had two panel discussions, one on access to capital and one on access to contracts. Uh And I was specifically prepping the panelists for the contracts panel. And so we did our debrief call, mm-hmm. presented the data. I had a representative from the federal government, a state senator. It was the U.S. Army Corps, the Veteran Affairs state senator, and then Meta. And we saw the data, some of the data, very sombering. Right. And one particular individual, he said, well, you know, I'm just going to go back and I'm going to look at my data and I'm going to look at the numbers because I want to know if this is true for our organization or not. And that in itself was a healthy exercise. Uh If everybody would do that, that would be a healthy exercise. Like, are my policies within my institution equitable Uh or are they skewed? 
And are the results equitable results or not? Right. And I thought if the conversation never went public, if that, you know, that panel never happened, but we caused a large government agency to pause and reflect, look at some internal numbers. Now, certainly there's work they need to be done, right? Because he right. found that his numbers were far off from our report. Mm -hmm. And we hope that there's work that continues to be done internally. But from an institutional perspective, I think there needs to be a strong pause and reflection, reevaluation. What are the policies that are causing inequitable outcomes for diverse communities? And how do we need to change and address that? Yep. I think that's what a lot of us need to start doing and working with organizations or to show the numbers and hold people accountable to say, hey, maybe you do need to look inside and and see what's really going on. I personally think they do know it's just that they were being called to the mat and they felt a little embarrassed because you can't go this long without knowing because it's too apparent in the social unrest and the economic injustice that's happening right now. Us wanting to have our share in the financial sector and to build better technology and change for our communities. I think this is a great conversation and I think this report, which will be available in the show notes for everyone to take a look at, to start gathering data and doing research on your community, run for your community organizations, and to see how we can build a network that will work in change reform for these policies. And I think that's awesome, Jennifer, because we do need more of that. And the network that L-Band is creating, I think it's opening some eyes that probably didn't want to look in the direction of where they need to change. Well, and if I could maybe just do a call out for some of the listeners, if they're thinking about like, how do I get involved or what could be my action step to support the Latino community and Latino entrepreneurs? And specifically, if you're not in an entrepreneurial role yourself, mm -hmm. if you find yourself in government or in a corporation, then, you know, how do you get involved? I would say if you were part of ERG groups, bring this data to conversation. Yes. Right? Like, I would be happy to share the report. I'd be happy. I've presented to ERG groups. Bring the data to life within your organization. If you're in a corporation and you have a procurement department, which I'm sure you do, a supplier diversity department, yep. ask the questions like, what do our numbers look like when it comes to Latino suppliers? How can we connect with additional Latino-owned businesses I'll raise my hand. I'm right here. I would love to connect you with Latino businesses that are ready and eager to supply to corporations. Yeah. And if you're in lending institutions, right, if you're be it a national, regional, community bank, CDFI, how are you connecting with the Latino community? You got to get to where they are so that you build a relationship so that mm -hmm. they get to know, like, and trust you as a financial provider so that when they're seeking capital... They already have all the steps down. They know what they need to knock on your door and get access to a good loan. So, Jennifer, I know you just gave us a call to action. What else can we do and where can we reach you? And, and what else should we do? Because we're all motivated. I'm motivated right now. I need to start working on my new business plan. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, here's what I would say, right? We should all be thinking bigger, be it an entrepreneur, be it a professional within your own organization. We should be thinking bigger. You said something at the at the beginning of this conversation that this is my phrase that I've been telling myself the last couple of months is sin vergüenza. Uh -huh. For so long, we care too much about what other people think uh -huh. and what the systems think. And I've gotten to a place in my career where I'm really like, sin vergüenza, if I don't do it, if I don't speak up, if I don't take action for myself, for my family, for my community, who really will? And part of it is asking for help, asking for the next opportunity, asking for partnerships, asking for introductions, collaborations. But I'm really at this place where I'm like, let's do it and let's do it with sin vergüenza. Don't hold ourselves back. Think bigger, dream bigger, and actually, most importantly, get connected. It's so yes. important to be part of networks, entrepreneurial networks, professional networks. Those are, I believe, lifesavers. 
And I guess lastly, I'll just close with this. I'm happy to connect on LinkedIn and you can follow Elban on our website. It's elban.us, L-B-A-N.us. There's an opportunity to sign up for our newsletter. If you yourself are a business owner and interested in learning more about our business scaling program, you'll find more information about that as well as the application. So we look forward to connecting and lifting one another up. Yes, I love that. And Again, they have a number of resources for you to take a look at and to sign up for their newsletter. I get the newsletter. It's very informative. And you can see all the new businesses that are getting funded through the network that they have created. So it's good stuff. Well, Jennifer, I just want to thank you so much for connecting with me. And again, I met her at South by Southwest. I saw her on LinkedIn. And this is how we're having this conversation because these conversations are not just staying in an echo chamber. This is going out globally to lots of different distribution channels and across the world. And that's my mission to create more Latinos and Latinas and communities of color to bring their mission, their passion, and their change for our communities onto this platform. So thank you, Jennifer, for joining me. I look forward to seeing you again at one of these summits. And let's stay in touch because I I would really love to learn more and hopefully be one of the cohorts in the near future. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you again for the opportunity. I wish you all the success with this podcast. I think you have an amazing mission, a bold mission in front of you, and I want to support you as much as I can. Aw, thanks, Jennifer. Gracias, Jennifer, for joining me today on Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom. Wow, you know, this podcast was really inspiring and an eye-opener to me from just being at the summit with her, seeing her again at South by Southwest, reading the 2022 research report, The State of Latino Entrepreneurship, which we'll have in the show notes for you here to download, really just put it all together for me that we're doing all the work. Our voices just need to be louder. We need to be advocating for one another. And Jennifer is really spearheading that by being present at all these panels and also trying to bring in more Latinas into the cohort at Stanford, but also really bringing up the financial aspect, which that is her background. So understanding that and all of us taking part and notes about this, it's imperative for us to understand to hold people accountable at those decision-making tables to bring the numbers of being supported financially for our communities to grow. So if you'd like to learn more about Jennifer, you can find her on LinkedIn at Jennifer Garcia at LBAN, that's the Latino Business Action Network. You can also go to LBAN.us to learn more about the Latino Business Action Network and the team. There is a lot of research there, which I like to go to, to pull a lot of data from. And it's very resourceful for those of you that are trying to put compelling business cases together for your pitches out there. So it's Jennifer Garcia at Elban, the Latino Business Action Network dot US. Gracias, mi gente. And again, please tell your friends to subscribe and download our podcast. Follow us at latinasb2b.com through our newsletter. And also we have a YouTube channel. So please subscribe there and look for some new information on some business tips that we'll be releasing after the summer in season five. Gracias, mi gente. This podcast was sponsored by 5E Leadership and Marketing, produced by Teresa E. Gonzalez of Latinas from the Black to the Boardroom, and audio engineered and sound design mastered by Robert Lopez. Gracias.